Hi and welcome to Dark Rain True Crime Channel. If you enjoy the story, please give it a thumbs up to help to get the video seen, and I'd love it if you'd hit that subscribe button. Today's video comes from Cardiff in Wales, and tells the story of the murder of Lynette White, and the controversy that surrounds it. Lynette White was born on the 5th of July 1967, to parents Terry White and wife Peggy. Lynette was a quiet child, with a soft nature, who always seen the good in people. She left school with no qualifications, and at 14, she was drawn into the world of prostitution. In a TV interview with the BBC, at the age of 14, she told the reporter that she was drugged by a gang of men, and forced into that way of life. Lynette worked seven days a week, and acquaintances said she was always the first girl out on the street at lunchtime and the last one left on a night, even working Christmas Day. By 1988, she was working every day to pay for her boyfriend Stephen Miller's cocaine addiction. Miller, who was also her pimp, took at least 60 to 90 pounds each day from Lynette, who was his only source of income. Each day, Miller would take her to the riverside to work the streets, before picking her up later to collect her earnings. The two lived together in a flat, in Dorset Street, Cardiff. On the 9th of February 1988, Lynette went missing, and made no contact with her boyfriend or any other contacts. Police assumed she was lying low, as she was due to give evidence in two trials, the first involved an allegation of attempted murder, and the second involved giving evidence against someone trying to procure the services of a 13-year-old girl, to get involved in the same kind of work that Lynette done. Police began actively searching for her, and a judge issued a warrant for her arrest, to ensure that she attended the first trial, which was listed to commence at Cardiff Crown Court on the 15th of February 1988. A few weeks prior to her disappearance, Lynette had borrowed keys to a flat from another prostitute, Leanne Vidley, with the purpose of using the flat to take customers to sleep with. After Lynette disappeared, Leanne was unable to get access to the flat, as she didn't have a spare set of keys, so she went to police, telling them of her concerns for Lynette. Police were eager to check the flat, as they had a warrant for Lynette's arrest, just so she could attend the court trial as a witness. Two police officers forced entry into the flat at 9.17pm, on 15 February 1988. They found Lynette, lying on her back on the bedroom floor, dead, having suffered massive injuries. She had been stabbed over 50 times, her throat was cut so deep that her bones were exposed. There was blood all over the bed, the floor, and the walls. Semen was present both in Lynette's vagina and underwear, which pathologists determined had been deposited there within six hours of her death. Some of the blood found on White's clothing, including her exposed sock, was found to be from a male with the blood type AB. Appeals for information led to several potential witnesses independently describing a white male, approximately 5 feet 8 inches to 5 feet 10 inches, aged in his mid-30s, with dark hair and a disheveled appearance. He was seen in a distressed state in the vicinity of the James Street flat, in the early hours of the 14th of February, he appeared to have cut himself on the hand, and had blood on his clothing. Other witnesses told police that they seen a group of around four or five black and mixed race youths, hanging around the flat at 1am on the 14th of February, the day Lynette died. Leanne Vidley, the person who gave Lynette the keys to the flat, told other prostitutes when she was drunk, that her boyfriend Stephen Miller and his friend Youssef Abdullahi, were responsible for Lynette's murder. This got back to police, and Stephen Miller was brought in for questioning. Miller who had a mental age of just 11, was interviewed by police 19 times over a period of 4 days, being in the interview room for a total of 13 hours. In that time, he made 307 denials to the murder, before finally confessing to police that he and four accomplices murdered Lynette. His accomplices were Youssef Abdullahi, Tony Paris, and cousins Ronnie and John Acti. The other four, all denied any involvement but were still charged with murder, police were relying on Miller's confession to convict them all. The trial began at Swansea Crown Court on 5 October 1989, but after 82 days of evidence, a mistrial was declared, after the sudden death of the judge Mr Justice McNeil, who died from a heart attack. The subsequent retrial, also held at Swansea Crown Court, 
commenced on the 14th of May 1990, before Mr. Justice Leonard. It was at the time, the longest murder trial in British legal history, lasting 197 days. On the 22nd of November 1990, three of the five accused were found guilty of Lynette's murder. Tony Paris, Youssef Abdullahi and Stephen Miller, who became known as the Cardiff Three, were each sentenced to life imprisonment. Cousins Ronnie and John Apti were acquitted of the murder, but both had spent two years in custody awaiting trial. In early 1991, a number of journalists began to question the safety of the convictions, and television broadcaster Channel 4 transmitted their own investigation of the case. Satish Sekhar, an investigative journalist specializing in crime and justice issues, had tracked down two witnesses not called at the trial that could provide an alibi for Miller's whereabouts at the time of the murder. Miller asked him if he would organize a new legal team to prepare his appeal. Sekar persuaded renowned solicitor Gareth Pierce to take on the case and handle the renewed application to appeal. Their appeal was heard over four days in December 1992 and ended after the Court of Appeal listened to an audio recording of Stephen Miller's police interrogation. Lord Taylor said that the police had bullied and hectored Miller during a travesty of an interview and that short of physical violence, it is hard to conceive a more hostile and intimidating approach by officers towards a suspect. He ordered copies of the recording to be sent to the Director of Public Prosecutions and the Chairman of the Royal Commission on Criminal Justice as an example of what we hope we shall never hear again in a courtroom. All three men had their convictions declared unsafe and unsatisfactory and were released back into society as free men. Police had to start all over again, this time, they had to do it right. In September 2000, the case was reopened. Forensic scientists led by Angela Gallup discovered fresh evidence, including a small trace of blood on the cellophane wrapper from a cigarette packet, and a further 10 traces of the same blood, underneath several layers of paint on a skirting board. But, after police checked the blood against the UK National Criminal Database, there was no match on the system. In January 2002, after advances in DNA sequencing, forensic scientists were finally able to obtain a reliable crime scene profile for the killer. Using the pioneering approach of familial DNA searching, a partial match was eventually made with the profile of a 14-year-old youth who was known to the police, but who had not been born at the time of the murder of Lynette. When police visited the boy's home, they were told his father was dead, but his uncle was still alive. His uncle's name was Geoffrey Gaffour. Gaffour was 38 years old and was described as a loner. He had very few friends when he was at school, and had not forged any other relationships in adult life. His sister told police that Gaffour spent most of his time watching television or reading and rarely ventured out other than to go to work. Police visited Gaffour's house on numerous occasions but could not catch him at home, so they went to his place of work, a block of flats where he had a job as a security guard. When they explained why they were there, he said, Oh, I thought you already had someone for that. Gaffour was unknown to the police, apart from a conviction for unlawful wounding, dating from 1992. He had struck a workmate over the head with a house brick following an argument, and was given community service typical British justice system, hit someone over the head with a brick, and get punished by picking up litter, or painting a fence. Giving out lenient sentences like that, isn't going to deter anyone. This was when DNA was in its infancy, so at that time, when people were arrested in the UK, there was no compulsory swab test. Nowadays, anyone that is arrested must give a DNA swab for the UK database. After he was arrested for the murder of Lynette, Gaffour gave police a DNA sample, and he was put under 24-hour surveillance until the results came back. The next day, police observed Gaffour coming out of his garage with three boxes of paracetamol, fearing he was going to take an overdose, police rushed to the house and found only empty paracetamol boxes, and he was then rushed to hospital. Gaffour initially denied to police that he had taken any tablets, but he then announced, Just for the record I did kill Lynette White. I've been waiting for this for 15 years. Whatever happens I deserve it. I sincerely hope to die. In hospital, he was heard telling staff 
the reason they are concerned is because I killed someone 15 years ago. They want me alive to stand trial. Actually it's quite a relief being found out and not having to hide anymore. At least I can die with a clear conscience for what it's worth. Gafour began to be violently sick, and eventually agreed to take an antidote for the paracetamol he'd taken, within a few days, he had recovered. Pleading guilty to murder, he said he was ashamed and sorry for his actions, his barrister said he had killed Ms. White, in a row over £30 for sex, and that Gafour had wanted the money back when he changed his mind. Gafour, then 38, was jailed for life with a minimum sentence of 13 years. In 2020, he was moved to an open prison, where he can just about come and go as he pleases, and in June 2021, a parole board found he was unsuitable for release. Probably best if they just keep him locked up. Of the five innocent men that were wrongly jailed for the crime, Ronnie Akdi and Yusef Abdullahi have since died. It is unknown whether they received any compensation for their wrongful conviction. In 2011, police officers involved in the original investigation were put on trial for alleged corruption. It was the largest police corruption trial in British history. They denied the charges before the case collapsed due to missing paperwork which was said to have been shredded. The paperwork was found not long after the trial collapsed. How convenient. I think it's disgraceful the way the British police handled this investigation, changing the lives of five innocent people by coercing confessions, and typically, not one of the police were held accountable for this. Fifteen years later, they finally got the right man, but who knows what he's been doing in that fifteen year. I bet if he committed further atrocities, then the blame would have had to have fallen on someone. What do you think? Let me know in the comment section down below. Thanks for watching, please hit that like button, and I'd love it if you would subscribe to my channel. See you in the next one.